we got that old natural sunlight that makes it a little hard to read. Um, so uh, I'm actually the faculty advisor for Make Open Source, for full disclosure there. Uh, but seriously, check them out. They said everything that, you know, they covered everything. I don't have anything to add, but seriously, check them out. It's awesome. It's only going to get awesomer with more people. All right, so let's get into some content. Uh, I'm going to start off with a quick demo. Today we're talking about Docker, which is a way to run your app in a, uh, a containerized environment. I'll get to the slides and explain uh, more of what's going on. Uh, but I want to show a demo of running Docker. And I'm going to show you running uh, my course website. So I have the files for the course website for cc312.com. Uh, all I did was clone the repository. And I have just the raw files. I didn't install any requirements. I didn't do any configuration, any setup. This happens to be a Python app. It's a Flask app that runs my server. Runs a server, but we're going to set this up using Docker, using what's called a Docker file. So you notice I have one file in here called a Docker file, which is effectively a startup script, which is going to say how to run my app. You can see the usual Python stuff. I'm installing the requirements with requirements.txt. I'm running the app using Python 3 and some extra stuff that we'll talk about in the slides. So to run this, I want to do docker build t. I'm going to run this command. <laughs> like I know that command, I've typed it so many times, but when it's a live demo, it's like, is this it? What, <laughs> when do I type? Anyway, uh, so I built that. I already built it uh, before lecture just to make sure I wasn't going to make a fool of myself up here. So it built really fast. When you build your Docker container, what this is doing is building effectively an entire virtual machine running an instance of, in this case, Ubuntu with Python installed. So it does quite a bit of work, but really what it's doing is downloading that off the internet and then running my pip install inside that container and then running my app. Uh, actually, it hasn't run the app yet until I type this next command, docker run which is going to take that container and actually run it and run my app. So right over here I have something, I have my browser open to localhost port 812, or 8312, uh, which doesn't have anything running on it, just to verify, just to show you that this is going to run in Docker. Now to run it in Docker, dash P, I'm going to choose which port, which is 8312. I'm going to map that to the port inside my container which we can see up here is port 5000. That's where my app is actually running inside the container. I'm going to map that to my local port 3 or 8312. And I'm going to add a dash D at the end here um, to, you know, I don't have to. Let me do it without that. Oh, I didn't set, <laughs> I didn't tell it the image name. I just said Docker build and, or Docker run and it said, what do you want me to run? CC312, that's what I want it to run. Refresh, and my app's running. I didn't do anything with Python. All the commands I typed, the two commands I typed in, were both Docker commands. I didn't touch Python at all. The Docker file happens to have Python-specific stuff inside of it, but I didn't have to mess with Python at all. So this gives, among a lot of other benefits, Docker gives us a way that uh, for your homework assignment specifically, it just helps logistics. You submit with Docker set up in your homework assignment, and that's how I can say, use whatever language you want, whatever technologies and everything. You know, we're just going to run Docker. So when the TA goes to grade your assignment, they type those two commands, and they go to the port that they chose. And if your website shows up, they can go through and grade it. If it doesn't show up, well, you have something messed up with your Docker file uh, that needs more testing. So this way, I don't care if you use Go, Python, uh, you know, whatever. You can use whatever you want. We're just going to run it with Docker with those two commands, and your app is going to be running. So that's where we want to get. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this just so. Uh, just so. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, they can map to the same port, your local port and the, the container port. It can be the same. Uh, this is, I don't know if I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'll mention it. I'll try to mention it multiple times. But for some reason with Python, it doesn't want to show the standard out. When I ran that, it should have so shown all the standard out in standard error in the console. It doesn't, it buffers, so it doesn't show until you close the app and stop the container. Uh, you do have to flush the buffer it, in Python, Python only. don't know exactly why it does this, but if you flush uh, standard out, 
uh, you'll be able to see your output in Docker. All right, but with that, the demo worked. I stopped the container, so this isn't running anymore. And with that, let's go to the slides and see what we just did and how to set that up on your own. And a reminder, I have, ooh, I have the Discord lecture channel open. If you have any questions, uh, put it in the Discord. Or raise your hand, you know, do the old-fashioned way, that's fine too. Or do the Discord if you don't want to raise your hand or for whatever reason <clears throat> you don't want to. Uh, all right, deployment and Docker. So how did we do that and how are we gonna set that up? So let's start with a little vocab. You may or may not have heard these terms before. Uh, you probably have at least at some point in your career by now, you're pretty far along in your computer science education, but your development environment and your production environment are two very different uh, environments where you're going to be working. Development, your development environment or just dev, this is where you spend most of your time, possibly all of your time at this point. Uh, this is where you're actually writing your code, you're adding features, you're pushing uh, code to get. This is where you're doing all the stuff. This is typically like our laptops or our desktops. This is where, uh, where we work. With uh, the classes that you've probably taken right now, you might not have even seen a production environment. Everything's in dev, you push it to Auto Lab, and then you forget about it. Production is where your app is going to eventually live. This is where it's hosted on a server, it's live for the world to see. Uh, that's where, that's the environment where your app should be running 24 seven, you shouldn't you worry about things like downtime and um, bu bugs going live to users, things like that. This distinction between these two things, this is where we get, it worked on my laptop. When, uh, when you get, it worked on my laptop, that means it works in your dev environment with this terminology, it works in your dev environment, but then when you push to production, there was a bug. Something didn't work when you push to production. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the whole team has to scramble, figure out where the bug is, and, uh, and figure out how to address that, how to deal with that, uh, what's, uh, what's going wrong. There are many, many things that can cause this. You've probably had this happen to you before. Your assignment works great on your laptop. You submit, and then Autolab says 0, 0.0. You say, crap, what do I do? What happens here? Uh, a lot of different things. If you have different versions of your compiler, your interpreter, we see this in 116 a lot. We handle it right at the beginning of the semester now, where if you have the wrong version of Scala or the wrong JDK, the ones that we don't use in the course, and then uh, Autolab is using a different version than you are on your laptop, well, you submit, doesn't run on Autolab, but it works on your laptop. Which is very, by the way, I don't wanna bash that it works on my laptop. That happens a lot for a lot of legitimate reasons. These are legitimate reasons. They're just painful reasons, it's tough. Uh, the dependencies not being linked is a big one. Uh, I've still had this, so of course we're leading up to Docker being the solution to all this. Even with Docker, I've had issues with dependencies not being linked properly. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that can still creep up on you. Hard-coded paths, I've seen this. Uh, recently on a project my brother and I are working on, uh, when you hard code your URLs using localhost, never do that by the way, uh, when you hard code your pass using localhost, once you push to production and you have a domain name, the domain name's not localhost, and uh, things are gonna break. Because localhost, when somebody gets your, your website, runs it on their machine, well localhost is their machine, not the server. Localhost only works when, uh, when the client and server are the same machine. So we can't hard code that. And a lot of different things, environment variables, you know, lots and lots of different causes. You probably came across a few that aren't on that list. So a solution to this, or, uh, or at least something to mitigate the issues that can arise, we'll still have some uh, sparse issues here. But some issues that, uh, uh, something that can mitigate this a lot is running a virtual machine. So instead of running your app on your actual um, machine on your operating system, we're gonna spin up another operating system using a virtual machine, virtualize that entire operating system, and then run the app inside that environment. Then when we go to deploy, yeah, okay. Uh, when we go to deploy, we're gonna run that same exact VM in production. So now we shouldn't, shouldn't have any issues because we're taking an entire copy of an operating system and just shipping it over to production, running the same VM on, 
on dev, now we have the same operating system, the same version of that operating system, the same versions of all the software installed, the same libraries, everything's effectively identical. Some things, you know, very small issues can still arise. Maybe the hard drive on your server is larger or something like that. You might have small differences. Um, but most issues should be resolved by running your app inside a VM. If you've used this, you've used VirtualBox and you've, um, and you've, uh, I'm blanking on the term, but if you've run two operating systems simultaneously on your machine, you know how expensive these things are in terms of CPU and, and RAM, uh, in terms of your resources. These things are not easy to run. Uh, if you don't have a lot of resources in your dev environment on your laptop, it, it's almost infeasible, certainly gets to be impractical. If you got like four gigs of RAM and only a couple cores in your processor, this is really gonna bog down your entire workflow. It's not the best solution. It does work, but it's not the best solution. But they got the name of what is. Uh, but there are also security benefits from this. If you're running your app inside a VM, if you do have that case where an attacker does compromise your server and gains access to your server and just starts going rampant and doing whatever they want, whatever destruction they want to cause, the common RM slash F, I should say RF, uh, slash, which just deletes your entire system. Uh, they can do that with your app, but if your app is running inside a virtual machine, they're only destroying your virtual machine. So you still have your actual hardware, your actual operating system, your host operating system running. You go into that operating system, you spin up a new copy of that VM, and your app's back up and running and then hopefully you patch the vulnerability, figure out how they got in and get rid of that, that vulnerability, but you just redeploy your app. They're not really destroying your, your machine. They're not getting into your physical box, they're just getting into that virtual machine and destroying that. Now, don't get me wrong, they can still do significant damage because they're stealing a lot of data. Once they get into that database, they're getting a lot of personal information. This is never a good thing. There's just one kind of like silver lining, like, well, we got attacked, but they didn't kill our host machine and we can get back up and running quickly. Um, it's still a horrible thing, getting compromised like this. But there's a little bit more security. I shouldn't say security, but a little more damage control when you have a VM and they're only attacking your VM instead of your host machine. Uh, this, uh, this type of security where people can't destroy your machine is required in certain apps. Autolab is the one uh, near and dear to me. AWS, Heroku, DigitalOcean. All of these apps, by design, take other people's code and run it, which is the most dangerous thing you can do uh, in terms of security. Taking somebody's code and just running it. Attackers usually spend a lot of time trying to inject their code into your system so they can run arbitrary code. Uh, they do uh, with uh, SQL injections and like all kinds of things to be able to run their code. These apps just say, nah, just send us your code, we'll run it. So we need security in apps like this. Uh, so what we do in each of these instances is run the user's code inside a virtual machine or as we're gonna see in a second, containers. Uh, Auto, I assume the other three, I know Autolab uses Docker with containers. If you submit to Autolab and you have that, no matter what it is, if it's hello world, there's like a 12 to 15 second delay. It's because it's spinning up an entire container, which we'll define in a second here. An entire container, which is a completely fresh instance of Ubuntu 20.04. Uh, the decimal's always the same, I forget off the top of my head. I think it's 04. Um, an entire instance of Ubuntu, brand new, fresh, out of the box, installed with all of the required uh, you know, interpreters and compilers and stuff installed and all the tools, GDB and things like that installed on it. Runs your code, which might just be hello world, and then destroys that container. Which, you know, 12 seconds ain't too bad, I don't think, but you know, we always wanna get that faster. Um, but it's running your code in a brand new, fresh install of Ubuntu. Same with others, if you spin up an app on these others, you know, it takes a little while to build your droplets in DigitalOcean. It takes a while because it's building, uh, it's starting up the entire container. 
All right, any questions so far? I see something in chat. I gotta. Yeah, if uh, if you modify the Docker file, you'll have to rerun, rebuild the image. Yes. Which I wish you didn't have to do, but yeah, you do. Uh, sometimes I want to just change like the port in the uh, in my app, uh, the port in the Docker file. Something where the app itself isn't changing, just the Docker file. You do still have to rebuild the entire image. Unfortunately, I don't know of a way to avoid that. I should say. If you find one, though, I'd like to know because I've had that case recently. I was just changing the port that I was exposing, or the uh, the port that I was mapping from my local machine to that container, which seems like something. There's probably an option to do that, but uh, I just rebuilt the container. Uh, so containers, this is the hot new thing. Not so hot, not so new anymore. It's still hot, but uh, this is what. Uh, what we call DevOps, which is basically the switch from dev to production, and then maintain that live production deployment. DevOps has been completely transformed since the invention of containers. Containers um, is what Docker is going to let us create. That's what my app and my demo at the beginning was uh, doing. I created a container. Containers are like VMs, but super lightweight. You don't have those issues of running two machines on your machine, or two operating systems on your machine. You effectively still are. But it does it. The the advantage here is that it shares resources very smoothly. When you run a VM, you have to say, "I'm giving this VM one core and four gigs of my resources." For example, with a container, you just say, "Spin me up a container," and then the resources are shared seamlessly. So you could spin up. You know, I don't have a hard and fast number, but you could. I've spun up ten containers on my machine on my laptop before, um, and it just goes. Without, you know, without noticing any resource usage, extra resource usage, unless those apps themselves just happen to need a lot of resources. Um, but the resource sharing is the big advantage here. So if you have a production app, some production apps will have hundreds of VMs or, or hundreds of containers where they couldn't have hundreds of VMs. So for example, Autolab has 240 containers just sitting there ready to be grading assignments. And that's something we couldn't do if they were VMs, at least not really feasibly. Uh, that's something we can do with the, uh, containers, though, because they're so lightweight. We can just spin up all kinds of them and have them uh, ready to do, to do our bidding. So Docker, finally at our, our big highlight. Docker is going to let us create and run containers. So this is how we're going to get our lightweight VMs. This is how we're going to. Uh, get our apps running in the exact same way in dev and in production is Docker. Docker creates our containers. Step one to using Docker, install it. It's an app. It's software that you download and install on your machine. So you need it downloaded, installed, and running on your machine uh, to be ready uh, to build these containers. If you have a Mac or Linux, this is pretty easy to do. Unfortunately, in Windows, installing Docker is quite painful. There's quite a bit of steps involved. Uh, you have to get a WLS, I believe it is, WSL. The Windows, Windows simulated Linux? Linux subsystem, WLS, Windows Linux? Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL. Uh, so you effectively have to install Linux, uh, a Linux operating system onto your Windows machine and then run uh, run Docker in there. I don't know, it, it's, uh, I'm not too savvy on it because I don't like using Windows, to be honest. Uh, if you haven't switched to a, a Unix or Linux-based operating system yet, um, I mean, it, it's just recommended that you switch. Install Ubuntu on your Windows machine, uh, even if you dual boot it, but uh, in this field, Windows just tends to get in our way a lot. It's, uh, I, I, I don't want to go too far on this because I don't want to sound like I'm just bashing Windows. Uh, Windows is a very great operating system for users. If you just want to use a computer, Windows is fantastic, especially if you're doing gaming. You basically have to use Windows. Uh, it's fantastic for that, and it's built for that. A Unix or Linux-based operating system where uh, Mac is based on Unix um, is built more for developers. It's built for writing software more so than Windows, at least. So there's a lot of things that are a little seamless for us in a Unix-based operating system that Windows just 
isn't made to provide. It's not like they can't. You know, they're starting to get on board with it. Um, but it's just not what Windows is designed for. Windows is really great for end user enjoyment, use, uh, things like that. Um, hopefully that didn't sound too biased. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you're still using Windows, just expect to do extra work in this field, like throughout your entire career. Uh, my, brother's, my brother is still, he's a developer as well. Uh, he's still all Windows, and I pick on him all the time. Every time he has an issue and he's swearing on his laptop, I'm like, you know, if you had a Mac or just install Ubuntu, <laughs> you wouldn't have that issue. Uh, he's actually starting to come around, too. He's uh, learning some uh, uh, Linux command line and stuff like that. So uh, anyway, install Docker. That's your first step. Install it on your machine. We're going to have Docker installed on all of our machines for grading. So we all have Docker installed. And Docker is going to read your Docker file to be able to know what to do, how to build these containers, these eventual containers. So the Docker file is a script which is going to tell Docker exactly which steps to take. It's very similar to a make file, where a make file tells, uh, tells a compiler or tells, ooh, what level does the make file work? At the, the OS level, I guess. Uh, just like a make file is made to tell how to compile your code, a Docker file is going to tell Docker how to create your containers and your images, which will make the distinction between image and container soon. Uh, so here's an example Docker file. We're going to go through this line by line. This is just an example. I, whenever I give an example like this in this class, uh, I tend to see this cut and pasted and then some minor modifications. Uh, try to avoid that, please. Like, understand what this is doing, and then uh, create a Docker file that fits your needs. Uh, how many times I see, like, this is just something I like to do, changing my, we'll talk about this in a few slides, but changing my home directory to slash root. It's just something I like to do. Um, you don't have to do that. You can, you can adopt that too, uh, but at least make a decision. I want to do that, or I don't want to do that. Uh, don't just blindly do what I do, please. I mean, some of you still will, uh, especially if you're uneasy about how this works. Uh, I get that, but uh, try to understand what's going on here. So let's go through this line by line. Um, by the way, this is this is uh, an example I wrote for, I have an example app for this class that uses uh, Node, and I have a file app-www that runs, excuse me, that runs my, uh, node app. So if I were just at the command line and I had all my dependencies installed on my local machine, I would run node app-www.js and that's going to run my app. So that's ultimately what we want to do. But we're going to start with a fresh copy of Ubuntu 18.04. It was 04. I don't know why I doubted myself on that. I know that. Um, so the top line of your Docker file is going to be a from line which is going to specify an, an image that you're going to start with, a starting image for your container. So I'm, going to, I'm saying from Ubuntu 18.04. So the very first thing Docker does when running this Docker container is goes off to the internet and downloads the image for Ubuntu 18.04. So it downloads an image, a Docker image, that is a fresh install of Ubuntu 18.04 and nothing else, just a plain old Ubuntu image. So it downloads that entire operating system ready to go, ready out the box. If I just said from just that first line and nothing else, I have a fresh install of Ubuntu ready to go, and I can do whatever I want with it. Once I create a container off of that, I effectively have Ubuntu on my machine, and I can go into that container and do whatever I want to do with my fresh install of Ubuntu. With a Docker file, we're going to run more commands. We're going to use the run keyword to run anything we need to get all the dependencies ready for our app. For this case, since we're running with, uh, we're starting with just plain old Ubuntu, I need to install Node. I need Node up and running on this thing. Uh, so first to do that, I'm gonna update app git, make sure I have all the latest repositories, all the latest stuff before I start installing things. Next, I'm going to do this thing that, that I like to do. I think I found this in, you know, even when I said that earlier, I actually found this in documentation earlier, and I just like it, so I, I stuck with it. Uh, but I made a conscious decision. I like that, that thing that this person did that wrote this documentation. I kept doing it. What I'm going to do is use two separate commands here, environment home slash root. 
I'm changing the home environment variable to the directory slash root to change my home directory to slash root so I know exactly what my home directory is. I don't know uh, what Docker sets as the home directory by default. I don't know, I don't care. I'm gonna, whatever it is, I'm gonna override it with slash root. That way I guarantee I know what the home directory is. If I ever have to jump into this container and change things around, I know where to look for my code. The home directory slash root, so when I go into the container, I'm gonna go right to slash root, I'm gonna be taken right there. And I'm also gonna change the working directory to slash root. So anything I do in this Docker file is going to be executed from the directory slash root from my home directory. So I know where everything is and I know uh, where to look for it if I ever have to go into this container, which is something you might never even have to do in this class, uh, but it is something you'll have to do if you start using Docker throughout your career, which if you're gonna get into web development, you're almost certainly using Docker or, uh, or one of Docker's uh, You know, it's pretty much just Docker these days, isn't it? Uh, if you're containerizing, which you should be, it's Docker. Um, I, I don't wanna go down that road anyway. Uh, so I'm changing my home directory to root and change the working directory. Working directory slash root, that's the same as saying CD slash root. I'm moving to that directory. I'm changing directories to slash root by setting my working directory to slash root. And then I'm gonna run all of my install node commands. I wanna install all this stuff. For some reason, node has to be done in three steps here. Uh, fix missing, I forget what that exactly does. I think it's a, it might be a hack, I don't know. Uh, installing node JS and NPM. It's important to have the dash Y here. Whenever you install, if you've ever installed something in Linux, uh, you go to install and then there's a prompt that says, are you sure? And yeah, I'm sure. If you do the dash Y, it automatically answers yes to that question. So since we're automating this, you're not gonna be there to hit Y. We wanna do the dash Y option, which automatically says yes, I do want to actually install this. That's why I typed the command. And of course, this anything else you need to install, anything you need to run your app, you gotta install it. Uh, any other software on the operating system level that you need installed, install it all. Then copy all your files. Copy is gonna copy all of your files recursively. So if you specify a directory, all of, everything in that directory, all of the subdirectories, all of the sub-subdirectories, everything is going to be copied over, starting with that directory, absolutely everything. So specify the directory you wanna copy from and the directory you want to copy to. I'm saying copy dot dot here. Dot is shorthand for the present, the current working directory whatever directory you're currently in. We're gonna run these Docker files from our project directory. So dot is the project directory. And then the second dot is going to be slash root inside the container. So I just do dot dot. Those dots are very meaningful, very important, but it's specifying the current directory in my host machine into the current working directory of the container or the image at this point, yes. Yeah, the, so the Docker file should always be in the root directory of your project. It, I mean, always is a bit strong, but if you're using dot dot like this, that implies that this is going to be in the root directory. You could have it somewhere else, but you have to change that path. Instead of just work current directory, maybe it's dot dot, move up one directory and then go. Or you can specify like just the project files instead of doing, like this is a, a covers everything, just copy everything over. Maybe you don't wanna copy the Docker file itself, Maybe you wanna make sure you ignore node modules. It's not something I do personally, but, uh, but that is something you might wanna do. Is it better to install node modules in the container? Um, in the container, for sure. Uh, because you're not gonna check node modules into your uh, repository. So when somebody else goes into production to run your app, they're not going to have. They're not going to run npm install locally and then run Docker. Uh, so you definitely want to install the node modules inside the container. If we're not in root, do we have to do sudo sudo apt-get update? No. 
So you have pseudo, you have super user privileges throughout this entire thing. The slash root up here for my directory, uh, that's just a directory name. That could be whatever. That could be uh, uh, Jesse rules or something. That could be whatever. Slash root has no meaning in this uh, context, other than that's just what I felt like naming that. Uh, but when the Docker file is being ran, you already have super user privileges. So you don't have to write sudo on anything in here. Oh yeah, I, I missed the previous question, but I covered it in there anyway. Yeah, that can be anything you want. I just happen to use root because, I don't know. And then download any dependencies you want. This is usually a step you're gonna have to do. Uh, maybe not necessarily for your homework since I say you can't really use uh, much of anything. Uh, but if you have external dependencies, you'd wanna download them, uh, download them in this file. And the order is very important here. Think about what you're doing in this Docker file. If I run npm install up here, which for those of you who haven't used Node, this is like uh, pip install requirements.txt. Uh, it's installing or running uh, Maven like we did in Scala in 116. It's installing all of the libraries that we need for this project. Uh, npm install is how we do that in Node. So if this line is above, say we put it right here, everything's gonna break. I hope you all see why. Because there wouldn't be anything there. So if we put that line right here, we're gonna do npm install. Well, I shouldn't say, I, obviously I don't expect you all to know that or else I wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, especially if you haven't used Node before, you might miss this. Uh, but Node, inside the project, we're gonna have a file. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> uh, Package.json? Package, you're, we're gonna have the package.json file, uh, which specifies all the dependencies. That's going to be like the Maven file, that's gonna be like the requirements.txt file in Python. Um, and that's going to be in our project directory, which doesn't get copied into the container until this line. So if we're trying to say npm install before we copy the files into the container, remember all these commands are being ran inside the container, or rather inside the image at this point. So if we do npm install before we copy over the files, which includes our, uh, our package.json file, it has nothing to install. It's just gonna say, okay, I didn't find a package.json, moving on without installing anything. And then you copy the package.json over, but then you never run npm install again. Uh, nothing's gonna work if you do that. So the order of things is important here. Uh, likewise, if you run npm install before you install npm, not gonna work. So this is effectively, if you had, without using Docker, a fresh install of Ubuntu, what commands would you have to type to get to the point where your app is running with you know, extra things like uh, changing the directory, exposing the port, things like that, uh, the Docker specific stuff. What would you have to type and in which order? That's what you have to be thinking of when you're writing this Docker file. It's effectively a startup script from Ubuntu to running your app. What needs to be done in between and in what order? So you need to be thinking about when you create a Docker file. Exposing, uh, in this case, port 8000. By default, all of the ports are blocked in Docker. You can't access a Docker container for security reasons. We want these things running in isolation. So if you want a specific port to be exposed, you have to say expose 8000, assuming that my app www.js is running a, a node application, a node web app that uses port 8000. So I'm gonna expose port 8000, letting people access that port from outside of the container. Then finally, run your app. Whatever you need to, uh, whatever command you type to run your app, right here. It's a little confusing, but never use run to run your app, it's command, CMD to run your app. You should only have one CMD line, should be the last line in your Docker file, and use that to actually start your app. CMD, that's very important. Run node app www.js wouldn't work, or at least not the way I expect it to. The difference between run and command is that run is going to execute whenever the container, or whenever the image is built, 
And then CMD is going to run whenever that uh, the container is ran. So whenever we start, so the two commands that I typed in the command line in the demo at the beginning, the first I built, I did docker build, and then I did docker run. When I do docker build, all of the run commands are executed. Even as I'm saying, it's like, man, this seems backwards. <laughs> the, why did they name it run when it's, when it's being built? Uh, all the run commands are ran when you build, and then when you run, only the command line is being executed. And then we have uh, everything we need to run this app, and the app runs. Now there is something significantly more convenient than starting with a fresh Ubuntu, and I highly recommend this. It alleviates a lot of headaches is instead of starting with just Ubuntu, there are tons and tons of images out there that have software pre-installed on them. If I want to use Node, I'm just going to do from Node 13 and not worry about any sudo apt-get, you know, whatever, uh, not sudo, but apt-get install. I'm not worrying about any of that. Uh, I'm just going to start with an image of Ubuntu with Node 13 already installed in this case, or whatever version of Node you need for your app. Just start with a container that already has that set up. There are tons and tons of containers out there. If you want to find a container for your language, just search up, you know, go to your favorite search engine, Docker, whatever language you're using, and there's almost certainly going to be multiple containers available for you to use instead of starting with a fresh Ubuntu. It's a good practice to start with fresh Ubuntu, but if you're trying to get through these homeworks and just trying to meet the deadlines uh, and you've got other classes to worry about, you know, Maybe not something you have to worry about this semester. Uh, so find the container, find a tutorial or some documentation for the Docker container for the language of your choice, and use that. You saw in my example earlier, I was using a Python image. That's Ubuntu with Python pre-installed. I don't have to worry about installing Python. Uh, so it really cleans things up. I still want to change my working directory, just personal preference. I'm still copying the files. I'm still running npm install to get my, my specific dependencies, my project specific dependencies installed. So exposing the port and running my app, but I ain't gotta worry about all this app get stuff. Not worrying about any of that. Much easier, much easier. All right, so now we're ready to build a Docker image. To do that, the first command I ran uh, back in the demo is docker build dash t which says I want to name this image and then give it a name and then dot. That dot is not a typo, that is very important. This is saying wh which directory am I building from? We have to tell Docker the directory that has the Docker image that we want to use to be able to build this thing. And it's gonna go to that directory, look for a file named Docker file with a capital D if it finds it, it's gonna build our container and give it this name, whatever name we give it. Uh, this is any name you choose, replace the whole thing I have highlighted with whatever name you choose. Like in the demo I used, chose CSC 312. Whatever you wanna name your image, uh, that's gonna go there. And that's going to build your Docker image, named image name. But wait, why do we care about an image at all? Uh, we wanted containers, we want our containers, which are lightweight, beyond, effectively lightweight VMs. That's what we actually want. We don't want an image at all. So why do we do all that work to build an image? Well, images are used to create containers. With that image, you can spin up 50 instances of your app if you want. Uh, you can use that image to, uh, to spin up containers at your leisure. Similar to classes creating objects, an image is like a class, and you say new class name and create objects. It's a, uh, about the same thing here. We have our image, and we say, hey, image, give me a new container, and then we can run containers based on that image. Will this work on dev, though, from node 13? Yeah. Uh, so it'll, so in dev and production, that from line says, go to the internet and download this container. So you're gonna get the exact same container in dev and prod. Yeah, so you only build once, and then you can create as many containers as you want and run them as many times as you want from that image. Anytime you make any change, you'll be built, rebuilding images a lot, though. 
every time you make any change to the code, you got to rebuild the image. Image. Yep, you rebuild the image after you change the code and then use the new image to create more containers. So there is a bit of a process. Uh, I do recommend testing your features without Docker, getting your features working without Docker, just because the Docker process is so slow. Uh, to rebuild an image and create a new container just takes a while. It really slows down your dev process, your development uh, cycles. Uh, so I would build the app without Docker and then add Docker at the end, or rather like build, uh, finish objective one, work on Docker, get Docker working, and then work on the other objectives. Make sure Docker still works with the new objectives uh, and don't just constantly rebuild images just because it, it takes a while. It didn't take any time here because I already had an image, uh, an image created. And Docker is a lot like Git where it only tracks the incremental changes. So if I change line 10 of a Docker file and rebuild, it's not going to rebuild lines one through nine. It's gonna start at line 10 and uh, just rebuild the parts that changed and everything after that. So Docker's really good about that. But once I make one change to my code, well now the copy dot dot line just changed. So that is reran and then everything after that is reran. Uh, so uh, it can take a while to rebuild every time. Yeah. Is your extension with Docker extension VS Code? The, uh, the Docker extension VS Code? I don't think I've used it. I haven't tried it yet. Oh. I just go command line. Like if I'm in VS Code and I'm using Docker, I'll open up the terminal in VS Code and just type in the commands directly. If it works, I, I don't care what you use at all in this class. As long as it works and you're not like importing HTTP libraries and things that are expressly banned. Uh, you can use whatever, whatever tooling you want, whatever IDs you want, uh, VS Code with extensions, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to use, it's all on the table. Uh, and whatever language you want to use, of course. All right, and then finally to run our containers. We have an image and we want to run a container, actually start up a container. We're gonna, I should have updated this slide. A lot of this is uh, super, uh, never pronounced that word, I don't know why I try. Uh, a lot of it's not needed. So Docker, uh, container, run, publish, port, detach, image name. The container you can omit. Uh, in the homework doc, I did update this to just a, a little more compact statement. Um, Docker, run, publish, you can use short, uh, dash p is shorthand. I want to leave that as dash publish here anyway, dash dash publish because it's more verbose. It's showing you what uh, what this is actually doing. Dash dash publish followed by the port numbers. Like this is all one option right here. Publish is going to map a local port on your local machine to a port inside the container. So if I choose a local port, like in my demo, local port was 8312. Whenever I get a request for TCP port uh, uh, 8312 on my local machine, it's gonna take that TCP stream, it's gonna take that information and forward it to port 8000 inside my container where my app is running. This way inside our containers, we don't have to worry about port conflicts. Like if, if uh, whatever port you're using for your app inside your container, I don't have to worry when I run your, your app, I don't have to worry about an app that I'm running on my machine already using that port because that's inside the container. It's not exposed to the local machine. To expose it to the local machine, we're gonna use publish, choose a local port, and if I'm running your app, I'm just gonna use choose a port that I know I'm not already using, and then map all traffic, local traffic from that port into uh, this port. And Docker's gonna go to the operating system and say, hey, I need local port, whatever number you choose, I need local port, Docker is going to reserve that port and maintain control of it so it can forward traffic to our container. Dash dash detach or dash D for short is going to, do I have more slides on this? Yeah, this one. Uh, or dash D for short, this is going to run your app in the background. Now for deployment, this is what you want to do. You want to run it in the background. So your app is just running, Docker's uh, keeping your app going and then you can go off and do other things instead of uh, having a terminal always open for your app or, or whatever. Uh, this is what you wanna do in the long run. When you're building your app, I actually recommend not doing this. I recommend leaving off the dash dash detach or the dash D and then 
uh, that terminal is going to be effectively running your app and showing you all of the output. Again, Python, make sure you're flushing standard out. Uh, if you don't know what that means, uh, you can come to office hours or Google it. Flush standard out is your search term for that. And, uh, and see what your app is doing, all, everything that your app is printing out to the screen. You want to be able to see that. You can't see that with, uh, in detached mode. So for development, I would leave off the detach. In prod, you definitely want to detach and let that app run forever over in Docker. Uh, and then image name at the end. Whatever image name you chose when you built the image, that's the same image name that you have to specify when you run the container. So I want to run a container, mapping this local port to this port inside the container. I want to run it in detach mode, and this is the image that should be used to create that container. And once I do, I'll go to localhost, this port, and I should see my app like we did at the beginning of the lecture. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I gotta take one minute to, to talk about this. Uh, don't use localhost inside your app. Inside your code, make sure you use 0.0.0.0 instead of localhost. If you use localhost, Docker's not going to be able to route the traffic properly. So when you're starting your app and it says, what's the, what's the host name, and you always type localhost, or you omit it and it defaults to localhost, make sure you're overwriting the host with that 0.0.0.0. If you don't, you won't be able to access your app through Docker, through a Docker container. So make sure you're doing that. That'll, that's a common question in office hours and stuff. Okay, and that's my last slide. All right, have a good weekend. I'll see everyone Monday.